So next I'd like to introduce Andrew Sneddon. Now Andrew is a, a lecturer um, at both Edinburgh University and Sheffield. Um, he um, is going to present um, a, a discussion, a, a paper that deals in some ways specifically with the, the exhibition out there, which I hope you have um, had a chance to see, but also within the context of a, a, a wider remit um, in terms of some um, a project that he's involved in called Gravity. So um, I'd like to introduce Andrew. Thank you. like the wrong button to have pressed. Oh. Oh, okay. um, hello everyone. Um, I'd, I'd just like to thank uh, Talbot Rice for giving me the opportunity uh, to say a few words today. Um, I, I, think, um, I think I might be here because, uh, possibly by accident, um, I, I went to a talk by Pat Fisher um, just around about in the autumn time, September, October time, and uh, Pat mentioned the Beholder exhibition. Uh, I, I, was, I was quite taken by it. and. Um, Taken to the point that I emailed Pat and told her about a project I was involved with called Gravity. Um, it's a sort of project, sort of based, I suppose, in Sheffield, but it's got a sort of further reach than that. Um, and I worked with two colleagues, uh, Dr. Becky Shaw and uh, Penny McCarthy. Uh, it's a project that that deals with beauty in some way from a very sort of practical level, and. Um, it's a project that came about by a sort of a strange sort of um, disclosure type discussion. Uh, the, the disclosure was that we were, as t teachers within an art college, quite interested in, in the B word, but it's the B word that we sort of never spoke about. We sometimes in the studio looking at um, artworks and they almost say that's that's a but we'd sort of stutter before we'd actually say the word. And sometimes when sort of conversation, we'd see a, a, a sort of beautiful show and we'd say that that was a fantastic, beautiful piece of work. Um, but sometimes when we're talking to, in the studio to students, we would, we would hesitate quite a bit in using this word because nobody uses the word anymore within an art context, within an art, art college, without really being careful about the words that we use. We'd often say it's, it, that's, that's quite an interesting piece. It's, it's quite a fascinating piece. Um, it's, it's quite a sort of interesting, fascinating sort of thing. Um, <laughs> but we'd, we'd never sort of bring ourselves to use the word beautiful, um, which is what the, the head was thinking, um, and possibly the heart as well. So we, we, we kind of realised that we were sharing this sort of um, guilty pleasure and appreciating things which were beautiful but not really willing to sort of put our hand up to it. And so the, the three of us sort of got together and we felt as though there was something happening. Um, again, th this is about 2009, 2010, and uh, Dave's book has sort of just come out, I think, and we sort of, we had a wee, wee look at it. Um, but, but the thing that we were sort of interested was, was like, th th there is something happening here within contemporary art practice that the beauty or the beautiful has somehow diminished or been devalued or sort of disappearing mm -hmm. somewhat. And we, we kind of thought it might be something to do with the notion of socially engaged practice, which was quite prevalent in the last few years alongside uh, relational aesthetics. Um, art schools up and down the country were kind of interested in this sort of way of working as well as museums and galleries and sort of professional artists. So we, we kind of thought possibly this as having an impact on bringing the notion of beauty down a little bit or sort of off the radar. So we kind of thought, let, let's, have a, let's have a sort of discussion about this. 
So there's no point the three of us sitting in the canteen having a discussion. Uh, so we thought we'd ask people that are at the sort of cutting edge um, of contemporary practice. And we, we kind of thought, right, let, let's sort of create a, a lecture programme and sort of invite people to actually say what they think about what beauty might be. Um, we, we kind of thought we were being quite ambitious and not getting anywhere. So we, we kind of asked quite a number of quite key artists that I think everybody respects and uh, they, they may have a sort of thought on what beauty might be. So, so we went for, I don't think you can read, maybe you can. We went for, or we invited Jeremy Deller, Carla Black, Labena Hamid, Jocelyn Kamek, Esther Leslie, Martin Boyce, uh, Kim L. Pace, Leslie Fisher, Edmund Duval, Sammy Bell, and Richard Sennett. Um, sorry about reading through that. Not all of these people turned up. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, most of them did, and we were really, really pleased that they did. Not, not so much pleased, but quite relieved and quite surprised. <laughs> And uh, we, we thought of that we, we could be on to something. And the ones that we, people, we didn't ask anyone else other than the ones on this list. So everybody sort of was up for it. And everybody knew the context we were wanting to do. Um, if you ever work with artists, they're in the same category as children and, and animals. So I would throw, never work with children and animals as well as artists. Because if you ask them to do something, they'll do the exact opposite. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty much guaranteed. So uh, what, what we asked is sort of um, being, being mindful of that, because we were artists ourselves, and we pr probably do the same thing, <laughs> is we, we asked them to talk about an object that contained something that was significant to them, S significant in the way that it was a beautiful thing that sort of, um, infused their practice, really significant and it shaped their practice. And uh, we asked them to think about this. And we also asked them to talk about this at the beginning of their talk. Our thinking was that it would simply knock them off line a little bit, that it would stop them delivering their party piece that <coughs> artists tend to do when given the opportunity. So we thought, let's not give them that opportunity. Let's, let's ask them to do something different. <clears throat> and L Lubaina um, Hamid chose um, this plate on, on your right um, from the Potteries Museum in Stoke. And uh, she talked about it um, in quite, quite an interesting way. Uh, she sort of talked about the fact that it was by, I don't think you can read it, it says, um, success to the Africa trade. George Dixon, um, and Lebena sort of talked about this as being quite a significant piece to her, and, and the fact that it really inspired her to think about it. It is a beautiful object in, in, in so many ways. It's full of cracks, it's full of history, it's beautifully drawn, naive at that time, those sort of how the, the boats and ships and the, the sea is rendered. It is a beautiful thing, <coughs> but, it, but it says something quite, 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 uh, Quite a nasty thing, like good good luck to the, the Africa trade. And so it had this sort of duality that um, I think Labina thought, thought was quite contradictory. So she, she, she thought this was the, the, the beginning of quite an interesting project. So she began to sort of put her emphasis on these objects and to change them, but to change them into sort of bringing sort of truth and, and a certain degree of value to them. Um, Labena created a 100-piece set and she would uh, acquire them from second-hand shops. There's no value to them. They're full of cracks. They're full of... Um, they're, they're of no value, really, to museums. They're not of a, a particular standard. Uh, and Labena admitted herself she even made that standard even lower by painting on them. <laughs> uh, so, so it made a really interesting piece and quite, quite a beautiful piece as well in some way. Um, the, the first artist, artist we kicked off with um, was Jeremy Deller, uh, and this is where, uh, if you ask an artist to do something, they do the kind of opposite thing. At the time, um, Deller was uh, making this piece where he, he took the, the exploded car or the bomb car from um, Iraq and he took it around America. 
So we were assuming, and he did allude to the fact that he would be talking about this object as being a beautiful object that, that held quite a lot of emotions, emotional content. And we sort of thought about this and we, we thought, we thought round about this object, how we might describe it, how we might think of it as being beautiful. And then the week before he arrived, he said, I've changed my mind. I'm going to talk about Battle of Orgreave. And I thought, right, hey, fair enough. <laughs> what, what do you do? We, yeah, let's go with it. So Jeremy talked about Battle of Orgreave in Sheffield. And uh, it, it, was, it was quite, I don't think we were quite expecting the result, and the result was simply quite an emotional, um, beautiful experience in some way. And um, he, he picked up on a couple of the, the segments. The Battle of Augury, for the people that don't know, is a reenactment of the 1984 miners' strike. Um, and he did this uh, around about 2001, as you see there. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about reenactments, we, we might look at um, uh, reenactments of sort of Viking Age or Stone Age or th things way, way deep past sort of thing. But the beauty of this piece, it was in, within living memory. And a lot of people that were there at that time are obviously still within the location. And they were quite interested to come along and listen as well. But Jeremy wanted to give the, the people involved in this position particular incident, an opportunity to sort of um, readdress how the media portrayed that event. And this is what he sort of set out to do. Um, so, it, so he did that. Um, so it's, I'm saying emotional because I was, I was standing next to uh, quite a big uh, steel worker and uh, there was certain quite a big burly steel worker, you, you probably know the type. And uh, there was segments of it when uh, it's this sort of documentary type approach to it. And there was emotional uh, recollections by a, a few people that were involved at that time and how the event sort of broke down the, the community. And it sort of pitched um, brothers against brothers against uh, father sort of thing. And th they were recalling this. And this big, burly ex miner was bubbling away, tears co coming down his face, standing next to me, and I thought, oh, why me, why me? <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was quite interesting that the beauty in this, I, I didn't see the beauty in this at the beginning. I thought, what on earth is he going to drag out of this? It's going to be beautiful. And uh, that, that emotional content was, was quite a, an emotional experience. Um, so, for, for me, that, that was quite an interesting thing. Um, it's, sorry, that's just another image of uh, segments from it. Because um, this is what I had in mind, what we were talking about. Um, De Deller often sort of talks about the, the, the instigation of this piece was back in 1984 when, when these images were piped into everyone's sort of through the TV into their living rooms. And he couldn't understand why there was pitch battles between police and miners and, and people getting clobbered. And it was just total violence sort of thing. He couldn't understand what was going on. So that was the starting point for sort of starting this. And the, the emotional content within this film is really of a very, very high, high degree. And uh, I, to be honest, I didn't actually recognize that until that day, that the emotional content was the, the beauty within Battle of Orgreave. Um, we we, we kind of asked people that we thought were um, as household as you get, really. And Car Carla Black is, is one of those people, obviously up for the Turner Prize recently. Um, and she, she talks about the, the beauty within the material. This is something else we talked about. We wanted people to talk about the material aspect, the actual object itself, not so much the content and what it means, but the actual thing that you're presented with in reality and that sort of visceral response to the materials like cellophane and talc and um, that sort of thing. We're kind of thinking a lot of people had only seen Carla Black's work like this on a, on a monitor or in a book publication, but to be actually confronted and, and she, the way she talked about the work uh, was, was really, really interesting. And I know you've got one upstairs, but it's a really quite a small one. 
Uh, I, I don't think it sort of does what Carla works do in some way. Uh, it's sort of an immersive experience where the senses come into play. You see it, you smell it, you, you, you can almost hear the crackling of the cellophane sort of thing. Um, so, so we felt that was, that was quite an interesting one to get discussing. Um, but in some way it was the contemporary beauty and um, it, it, was, it, was, it was a tricky, tricky talk to, to sort of get my head around. Um, this, this is where we, we tried to do the talk and make it as public as we could to get as many people interested in, and, and we had to work with Millennium Galleries and it was a smaller venue and this is the venue for Edmund Duval. Um, Edmund Duval and Jeremy's talk were uh, in the Millennium Galleries and we could have filled it twice, three times over. It was so, there was an awful lot of interest in both of those, um, particularly with um, Edmund Duval writing the, the, here with the Amber Eyes and talking about the little Netskis. Um, for, for, for Edmund's talk, he, 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 he chose the little Netskis and he I was absolutely horrified. He passed, he passed these valuable little Netskis around the audience, and I was thinking, God, they're my students, they're my students. He's never going to see them again. Um, but thankfully, um, they all went round and they all came back. But again, he was hold, people were, had the opportunity to hold them and to pass them on. And the way they passed them on, uh, these little things, they're, they're, they're not... They're not fragile, but they're very small and, and again, very beautiful, but he passed them on and the, and the care and the attention that people were passing them on from hand to hand it was, was quite something to see, really. There you go. Um, and the, the, the beautiful thing within his talk, and I think I began to sort of realise, because it was a, seen as a research project, this, and we wanted to try and not just ask people in to talk about it, we wanted to try and work out what was beautiful within contemporary art practice, or what was important, what was valuable. And uh, I think we're beginning to sort of see something with, within Edmund's talk, when he talked about the, the history behind these objects and how they came down through history, through deep history, and how they suffered um, uh, misfortune and um, success sort of thing. And I think by him doing that, it, it helped us understand what a lot of designers and ceramicists see within Evan Deval's work as being beautiful. Um, personally, I'm a bit of a philistine when it comes to ceramics, and I didn't quite get it. I think they're just pots. Um, but after that, I think I understood much, much more by, by Evan Deval sort of talking about the narrative behind these objects. It was actually quite a fulfilling experience that I, I kind of can't look at ceramics again anymore with, and think they're, they're just pots. Um, th th this, this Roger Scruton has been mentioned already. Um, I was aware of his video uh, that was screened a few, few years ago now. One of the speakers didn't turn up um, on the day and I was aware of this, so I sort of ran to the library, got his video out and plugged it in, because we had a lecture room full of people wanting to see something on beauty. I kind of knew it would be confrontational. I didn't, in my widest uh, dreams, believe how confrontational this video was. Uh, it was quite incendiary within the studio, and uh, it was very, very interesting. And. Uh, the, the, the audience took it apart very, very quickly and quite emotionally charged and quite aggressive. And unfortunately, was the aggression at one point was directed to me because <laughs> I put the video in, uh, which was quite unfortunate. I'm still trying to sort of live that down. It wasn't my video. I only <laughs> put it in. <laughs> so um, it, it's, it's very, very interesting writer and philosopher and uh, he's, 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 he's been mentioned, as I said earlier on, um, but he, t he talked about beauty pretty much within class and value and society sort of thing. He talked about art, he talked about architecture, he talked about music, but the things that he picked upon to talk about were often seen as like 
that this is very clumsy. High, high brow, high class, music, orchestra, that sort of thing. Um, he, he thinks uh, Prince Charles is fantastic when he comes to designing towns, small new towns like Poundbury. He thinks he's bees knees. Um, so I think this is why, and he picked it, I should have thought of the audience as well, but I, I kind of never realised, uh, and they sort of took it apart because of the, I think possibly where, where it was filmed and uh, where it was screened in, in sort of South Yorkshire. But nevertheless, I think it, it also polarised the audience because some people thought he's actually talking a lot of sense and uh, 80 to 90% of the audience thought he was, he was talking a lot, not very, not very good things. <laughs> um, so he, he, he kind of, he was kind of pushing skill and craft as being really important things, as being part of beauty. And some of the things I mentioned, like Edmund de Val's Little Netskis, incredibly beautifully crafted objects. So I, I kind of think I'm slightly part of the 10%. At the same time, it would bring someone like um, Sandy Stoddard. It would wheel Sandy Stoddard's work out, um, who's sculptor to the Queen, and say, this is real, proper, contemporary sculpture. And he'd compare it to someone else who, who's not. Uh, he'd also compare Courbet's uh, bed, uh, bed of the artist full of sweat that is beautifully painted, beautifully crafted, but he'd compare that to Tracy Emin's bed. So with these binary opposites, it would just roll out and uh, it would address his, his particular point of view. Um, but it, it was discursive and it, and it wasn't a, a kind of good thing to do, but I wish someone else had put the video in. <laughs> um, why I was interested in uh, being here today was when I came, I was really excited to see the show, uh, Beholder. And when I came to see the show, I couldn't quite get it. I couldn't quite understand it. I couldn't, I couldn't get into the show. I couldn't, I thought, where, the, where on earth is the beauty in some of these things that are being shown? And I, 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 had to, I really struggled with the, the concept. I understood it. I understood the turning over the curatorial aspect to other people. But, but I, I kind of thought there was something going on there that wasn't anything to do with beauty. But looking at the show, I, I kind of thought, well, where, where do I see beauty? And I kind of, this isn't the one that's through here. This is another one. Uh, the Mirandi, and I, I think as, as painters probably highly rate Mirandi in some way. It's beautiful little gem-like paintings um, are, are something quite interesting. Um, and I thought, well, why, why am I finding that beauty? And there's, there's so many contemporary art practices out there that are dealing with other things. So I kind of wanted to think about the Mirandi. Um, and, and I couldn't really, to be honest, find a way of thinking why I thought that it was beautiful. And then I started to think about and reflect upon the research that we're doing at Sheffield with the, the notion of narrative and time. Um, and, and I sort of thought, I remembered um, Tasta Dean's piece on Mirandi's studio. And uh, Tasta Dean sort of filmed it. And uh, I wondered if what I was thinking about the notion of beauty within that piece next door was wrapped up within the notion of time, um, time and narrative. And there is an element of time. He spent 50 years in a studio painting still lifes. And uh, some of these still lifes are, are quite dull, but incredibly beautiful at the same time. So again, there's a kind of contradiction in there. Sometimes you don't think as being dull as being beautiful. Um, I, I, I don't know, but that's, that's a question out there, really. Uh, and there's another piece that uh, Dean did uh, day and night where, she, again, she visited the studio, wasn't allowed to do anything with the objects, but she, she filmed it, and I, I couldn't get hold of a film. Um, as we all know, um, Tasta Dean not, not too keen on the digital, and um, I couldn't get hold of the 16 mil. But, but these are the objects, and the objects in themselves contain something. Um, they have they have a sort of resonance in some way that they, they, they are quite familiar to us if you look at the paintings, if you study the paintings. Uh, 
Um, and the, these are the, the residue or the, the, the dust, the dull things that, that isn't necessarily seen as being art. These, these are the sort of the silhouettes left on, on the table. Uh, and these are the drawings that he, he drew around them. So I'm kind of thinking these things when I'm looking at the painting next door, and I find it quite difficult not to look at the ones next door without thinking of this and without how Dean looks at it as well. She, she makes it more, um, she brings out the narrative of the painter somehow. Um, I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much, Andrew. So again, I'd just like to take maybe one quick question from the floor um, before we swiftly move on. So do we have any questions? I have a question. Okay, if, if you I'm want, please. Yes, please, please do. You can. <laughs> um, yeah, you said that teaching fine art in an art school, you had a problem uh, describing students for <laughs> you and the staff. Want to move forward into my... Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, you said in teaching in an art school, um, teaching fine art, you had a problem describing students' work as beautiful. I taught in a design department in the art school and there was no problem ever describing a student's work as beautiful. And I just wondered what, how you might account for that difference. Okay. Um, you, you might work in a better art school than me. <laughs> um, that, that, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind, of, kind of thinking, I, I don't know. Um, I think within fine, fine art um, tradition, and I think it's a very fine fine art tradition, the, the, the notion of cr critical debate is, is, is paramount within the studio. It's more paramount now than it ever has been, but it always was, so it, it must be really, really paramount now. So I, I think where our education is at the moment, it, it, a lot of people could see it as being in a uh, crisis. And that, that's a kind of strange word. It's quite a worrying word. It's quite a dangerous word to use. But at the same time, I, I, I kind of think it's a good thing to be in crisis. It's a good thing to be questioning everything and anything that moves. Um, so um, beauty, beauty doesn't come into it at times. Uh, and you, you kind of need to sort of um, remember that and sort of put it to one side. Because I think I went through a tradition of um, the aesthetic being quite paramount and critique not being, uh, and that wasn't really all that long ago. Um, I, I sort of studied at Glasgow and I studied in Italy for a year, and I, I, I kind of thought I, I, it's, it's kind of in me what what the notion of beauty is, sort of thing. And I think working within really good critical debate institutions, which, for the record. Sheffield and Edinburgh are, uh, the, it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful thing to be involved in, but I think I and some of my colleagues had to sort of do a bit of a mental shift almost every day and sort of uh, change how we thought or, or adapt or be conscious of how we think about contemporary art practice. So I, I don't know about, I know, I know nothing about design. I know very little about thoughts. Do you think it's less critical? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Uh, certain aspects of it are less critical, I would say.